Hello, and welcome to this week's episode of Politics in the Pulpit, a lectionary-based preaching resource designed to ask the provocative question of whether, and if so, how, politics should appear in our preaching this week. My name is Jenny Mills, and I'm the Secretary for Education and Learning in the United Reformed Church. Each week, I'm joined by a different guest from a place and space on the pulpit and political landscape. Today, I'm really pleased to be able to introduce you to the Reverend David McLaughlin. David and his wife, Mary, are joint pastors of Dormansland Baptist Church in Surrey. He tells us that in ancient times, he trained at Spurgeon's where he is now an associate tutor. His particular area of study is Christian theology and disability. David's more active hobbies include climbing and surfing and his musical taste turns towards, leans towards jazz. So it's great, with great delight, I welcome David to join us this week. Hello, David, welcome. Hi, Jenny, thanks. It's very good of you to, to have me here. I almost recognized myself in the description there. Excellent, excellent. I'm not sure about the ancient times, but maybe you, you know, maybe you can give us some insight on that one. Thank you so much for joining us to, to consider politics in the pulpit. How do you encounter that word, how, those words? How do you hear yourself or do you hear yourself as some sort of um, um, person of politics in the pulpit? Well, certainly not, not party politics. Ah. <laughs> so not, not politics with a big P, but very much yeah. politics with a small P. I, I suppose any, anyone who preaches, anyone who ministers, um, is doing it among people. As a number of your contributors have said, you know, politics is about polis, the people. And, you know, if the gospel is not about people, ordinary people, then uh, I don't, I'm not sure what it's about. And so you have this, this um, powerful mixture in the gospel of, um, of justice and sacrifice and victory. Um, so I think whenever we get up to share the gospel, it's got, it's got a political edge to it. Um, you know, I would say particularly in our times, but I suspect it's in, in all times. Um, yeah. But with people uh, coming out of COVID and uh, wondering what to do about the cost of living, wondering what to do about war um, on our doorstep, um, and not to mention trying to get decent health care and mental health care. Mm. Uh, these are the things that the gospel speaks into. So yeah. the churches are trying to, to get to grips with how to, not just to preach the good news, how to, how to actually be some good news um, yeah. and model that in the, in the communities. So you've already named a few um, a few issues that we're dealing with. And I think when we come to Amos, it kind of almost could be written for today, but we'll come back to that later. Um, but are there any sort of key justice or political issues that, that engage with you as, as pastor and tutor in your particular roles at the moment? The ones that are perhaps more um, higher on your agenda? Well, I suppose in, in the sort of pastoral setting, um, where we are, you know, the focus is is very much on um, trying to create what we're looking at as a church is trying to create a, a kind of hospitable, safe place for people to be uh, from which we can then offer services in the community. And so we're looking at in our particular church, we're looking at setting up as a kind of community cafe type yep. um, set up where we can also um, perhaps set up a, a community fridge and that sort of thing. Um, yeah. I think one of the political things in our landscape, you know, is that if as a country, and, and this again goes into the texts, but if as a country, you know, we're embarrassed about the need for food banks and those sorts of things, well, we ought to, to be, you know, and if we're embarrassed about the fact that people can't afford to, to put food on the table and to heat the house, well, we ought to be embarrassed in a, in a country as wealthy as ours that, that those yeah. are so that that's very much in the pastoral setting in in the teaching setting um i suppose my main interest has been around disability and theology yeah. and uh, disability and inclusion those are those are very tricky words even as you yeah. start to get into them but they are a matter of justice they're a matter of of who has power and what yes. do we say um, yeah and so yeah. It's it's interesting that 
in in the teaching whenever the question of of disability and disability in ministry and in churches comes up it's all that, that students then want to talk about it. you know trying to get back to the subject at hand is 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 often quite hard so <laughs> it, it's it's a it's a subject of the moment it mm. really is yeah well thank you very much so as we have those uh those those issues and thoughts in our heads uh, each week uh, my jpit colleagues uh, round up some bits of the news now i i'm, I'm not sure i apologize but it's a busy time in the world at the moment so i'm just going to read some of the some of the things that I, i've been sent by jpit so that we can have those in our heads as we then launch into the texts uh, obviously the prime minister announced his intention to resign on thursday he will continue as prime minister uh, until the conservative party appoints a new leader which is expected to be around september october although as we know in this within the political landscape at the moment these things are subject to change and we we don't know what's going on with that really um this raises a number of questions about boris johnson's legacy and behavior as prime minister the role of Conservative MPs in ousting him. His resignation was triggered by over 50 of his ministers, junior ministers and PPSs resigning. Um, Conservatives and uh, Conservative MPs and also party members are the ones who will choose the new Prime Minister. And Johnson criticised them for acting as a herd, whereas many had been calling for them to act much sooner. We have the question of the appropriateness or otherwise of Johnson staying in office for the next few months and whether the government will be able to function in the interim as the country struggles with the cost of living crisis and who the next prime minister will be and what direction that the government will take then. Will they seek to break with the Johnson programme and style of governance or will they seek continuity in order to appeal to the same coalition of voters that won a majority in 2019. What does it mean for levelling up, taxes, public spending or Rwandan deportations? These are all important questions of justice beneath the, part, the, part, the drama of power politics. We also have the, um, the uh, ex-Prime Minister of Japan, Shinzo Abe, who was shot on Friday and has died. The heads of MI5 and FBI made a rare joint statement about the immense threat posed by China as worries grow about the possibility of moving moving to retake Taiwan. Sri Lanka's economic, con, uh, economic crisis continues with food, gas and medicine in short supply. The Methodist Church has a fund to support people in Sri Lanka, which we can find on their website. Sydney has received as much rainfall in four days as London does in a year, with thousands evacuated amidst the fourth flood emergency in 16 months. And in the UK, we are looking to potentially some of the warmest temperatures that we have experienced in years uh, in the coming uh, couple of weeks. Finally, the UN Development Programme has warned that the global cost of living crisis is pushing a further 71 million people into extreme poverty in the world's poorest countries. Uh, and uh, as we have mentioned quite a few times, we're in ordinary time in the church so that we're all just uh, plodding along and uh, and seeking to be faithful followers of Jesus and seeking to live God's way. So with our metaphorical newspapers in one hand and our Bibles in the other, let us launch into these texts. And I, I hand over to you to lead us through these texts and share with us your reflections and wisdom on the text that we have this week. Okay. Um, well, certainly if anyone's seeking to to preach, um, there's no end of subjects to <laughs> to to, um, to to alight on. I'd, I'd written my own list just to see if it matched up with yours. I think the only uh, couple of other ones I had was the strikes that, that seemed to be um, yeah. all over the place. Um, plus, what's going on in Hong Kong uh, 25 years after um, yeah. the, the what should we call it handover? Anyway, um, thank you so much. That's brilliant. Thank you. So, um, yeah, so I had a look at those uh, at the four texts. We've got uh, Amos, um, we've got uh, a Sam, we've got uh, Luke, uh, and we've got uh, Colossians 1. And I have to say, when I looked at the collection of, of texts, I thought, my goodness, uh, that's a very disparate selection they all seem to be facing in very different directions so psalm 51 just to sort of put them in their places psalm 52 rather is is one of those situational psalms it tells us that this was when doug uh, when uh, 
David was on the run on the run from Saul, and uh, I don't know how you pronounce it. Is it Doug the Edomite or Doeg the Edomite? I think uh, we'll we go it, with whatever we, we'll we know what Doug. we mean. Um, and he shops David to Saul, and says he's gone down to um, to be with Ahimelech, and and David is really angry, and you can you can hear it in the in the psalm, and then Amos eight. I guess that's the most obviously justice related passage <clears throat> of the four uh, but then that's Amos is very much in that vein and so so the passage in chapter eight says well here are the consequences of abandoning God and treating the poor really badly and it's all very very dark stuff yeah. and yeah. everything will be lost then Colossians one of course is this um kind of cosmic level um him to who Jesus is, on which so many hymns and songs have been based, uh, just about how amazing Jesus is. And then Luke 10, we, we uh, total change of gear to a, a kind of small domestic scene, Jesus at the house of Martha and Mary. So when I first looked at them, I thought, well, it's going to have to be one or two. But actually, I, I'd, I'd like to keep all four in hand because I think with all with all four we we see something I think particular about the explosive difference that Jesus makes um, to the kinds of situations that we that we've been talking about up to now. So um, and it's not it's not that well the Old Testament is all bad news and the New Testament is all good news because now we've got Jesus, um, <laughs> but. Um, I mean, it's good news that we've got Jesus, but there's a yearning in those Old Testament passages that they help us to explore, um, which is partly answered there, but is only really completely fulfilled in Jesus. And I think that opens up a way to think about how we can respond in the world. Um, okay. So, so. So I think we'll do that. We'll go with all four and, and we'll always keep sort of leaning towards those justice questions. Right. As we go. Um, if someone was preaching this, th there's such a broad um, scope that, that, that could be drawn on. But, but hopefully these thoughts will uh, provide something useful. So, so Psalm 52 and Amos 8, I think both of those... Um, did you want to jump in, by the way, and say anything? No, no, I... no. Oh, this is great. Uh, I'm really yeah. enjoying this. No, no. Uh, and believe me, I, I will interrupt if I feel the need to. That, that's fine. That's fine. <laughs> just don't, don't, don't squeeze you out. Um, no, not at all. So I think both the Psalm, Psalm 52 and Amos, they both open the way to explore one of the questions that really was in the headlines there, which is, what do you do when those who ought to provide justice don't? Yeah. You know, what do you do? when the, the people and the structures that are there for the benefit of the people yeah. don't work, they, they're not providing justice. Um, and we could say, well, that, oh, that sounds like a week in Westminster, but it's, 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 it's a huge question for the whole of our world. So it, it's, it comes down to refugees and asylum seekers, people uh, internally displaced people, um, it comes down to a massively overstrained justice system, for instance, uh, which is another one we could add to our list. Um, it comes down to the abuse of power in all its forms yeah. in pretty much every country um, across the world. So, so those two passages, they don't provide all the answers, but they, I think they open the way to explore some of the some of the question, Jenny. Do you think, I mean, for me, the Amos reading was kind of holding, almost holding up a mirror to our world, because this idea that um, the well, the, the the wealthy, the rich were finding ways to make themselves richer, and and by doing that, just oppress the needy, and and we're seeing around our world and in our country this sense of uh, individualism. And, you know, the structures there were set up to perpetuate injustice. And it feels to me that we, you know, that, that mirror's being held up to us. We see around us so many structures that are just feeding into injustice, don't we? 
I think that's absolutely right. You know, when we read through that that Amos passage, <clears throat> um, you know, we're more familiar with the Amos five, aren't we? You know, let let justice roll yeah. on like a river, righteousness like a never flowing stream. All of us who wish we were Martin Luther King Jr. Um, but um, but this particular passage, as we read through it, it I think you're right. It, it speaks into that kind of spiritual and and I guess moral desert that we often find in in political and business leadership. Um, so to to paraphrase it, it, it it's it says, okay, when can we when can we finish with all this religious stuff, you know, all these festivals and the Sabbaths, so we can get back to what really matters. You know, when can we get, you know, let's get through the through the, the religious festivals uh, and then we can get back to making money, um, back to economics, back to building our power base um, in whatever form it comes, you know, back to our, our kind of, you know, tech millions and all that sort of thing. Um, and if the poor are trampled along the way, well, that's just the cost of progress. Yeah. You know, that's collateral damage. And that you're, you're absolutely right. That's that's really what they're saying and and the message of amos of course so much of it is that we will reap what we sow um and and there's um there's the verse in the middle of it uh, verse seven where it's god says i will never forget anything they have done yeah. and so so his judgment will come and and i think you know when we talk about so sometimes we can veer off from talking about God's judgment, but why would we follow a God who doesn't bring judgment on unjust structures and unjust systems? Why? Because his judgment is the bringing of justice. And there are plenty of people who will never see justice in this life. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it has to come from God in the end. Why would we follow any other God? And that whole message about if humanity lives, uh, if humanity um, turns from the way of God, so when humanity loses uh, the focus on integrity and justice and peace, when we separate ourselves from that and from God's way, then humanity goes down paths that, that lead us into these wrong ways of living, doesn't it? I think that's absolutely right. And, and um, I, one of the most interesting bits in the Amos passage, and then we'll have a quick quick look at Psalm 52 but right. one of the most interesting things is it says okay so all this stuff is going to go go you know God's judgment will come the sun will go dark and um all that sort of thing and then it says um and then there will be a famine and it's not a famine of food and drink it's a famine of hearing the words of the Lord um in verse 11 there you know people will search for the word of the Lord and not find it. And again, that speaks into our times because when there is a real disaster, suddenly people want to hear from the church. People, oh, what, you know, minister to us, minister to us. Um, but of course, then when the church speaks up for justice, take, for example, Justin Welby talking about the yeah. Rwanda scheme. Oh, no, 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 we don't want to hear that. Exactly. Uh, tell us, tell us peace, peace, everything will be okay. Um, you know, echoes of Jeremiah there. Um, and, uh, you know, this, oh, the, the church has to stay out of politics. Well, uh, that's simply not the case. It's not um, going to happen, is it? No. It's not going to happen. And, and the, but, but what's interesting is that that yearning, that yearning for the word of the Lord is not just among God's faithful people. It is something that is fundamental to being human. And that in the end, we are starved of it uh, when, all, when we're surrounded by injustice. Yeah. Um, and in the end, we do look for it, uh, but it's uncomfortable when we hear it. Um, and people yeah. sometimes don't know what they're looking for. And so they, yeah. they, 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 they seek the solace in, in various other ways. Yes. And, and, and at times, I just wonder at times if we have made the gospel so complex that people struggle to hear it, because yeah. we've made it, we've made it either you have to jump through a bunch of hoops or, or we've made it complex and difficult, don't we? Yes, yes. Or it's, or it, it's, it, or it doesn't contain anything uncomfortable. Mm. Um, you know, it doesn't tell us that the way we're, the way we're behaving is actually wrong. Mm. Um, 
So wow, wow. Um, okay, and then Psalm fifty-two. Psalm fifty-two is an interesting, interesting one. Um, so, in in Psalm fifty-two, um, so so David's being being pursued by Saul, who ought to be you know, he ought to be protecting his people, um, and and he's aided by this chap Doug the Edomite, and the temptation in in situations of injustice like that the temptation towards revenge and anger is intense and it's it's pulsing away in the first half of the psalm in in really vivid terms you know, the anger and the desire for revenge is is intense there um it's not quite clear in the psalm whether it's whether it's all directed to to Doug the Edomite, or whether it's all towards Saul, or whether it's a mixture of the two. Yeah. Um, the, this Doug the Edomite was a was a kind of head head of the shepherds. He wasn't, you know, no small cheese, but but he, he wasn't the king. So, um, although sometimes but, we can we can get everything wrapped up in one, can't we? And we just go for the enemy. One. Yes. And and but interestingly, what then? Um, again, it's not the whole answer, uh, but but what then David does is he hands it to God. So there's this intense anger. He he hands it over to God and says, "Well, I'm now I'm going to wait on God. Um, I'm going to plant myself um, in the the temple of the Lord in the house of God." He, he says, um, and again, it's not the whole answer. But if we can't hand that kind of anger at things to God and 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 work with God on it, then either it eats us up. Or we end up acting rashly in some way that, that we will regret and everybody else will regret. So that that response to that immediate anger um, has to be to take the things to God. But it's a God of justice. It's a God who brings who, who will bring his his judgment. So then, of course, we've got to think, well, what do we do with Colossians one and Luke 10? Um, but so as I say, those I think that those um, in those two Old Testament passages there's this kind of yearning for God to bring judgment to bring an ultimate justice um, and he does act against Saul he does act against Israel but it's this sense that we're in a cycle you know we'll, we'll be back there again there'll be more injustice um, we'll be back to the same prayers so what difference does Jesus make in all of that when when those who ought to be providing justice don't do it um, and I think the place to go then is is the Colossians one passage. Okay. Um, and it's this amazing description of Jesus. It, you know, it really is up there with most people's favourites. Um, and I think the point of us here, the point for us here, really kicks off at the start of it uh, when it says in verse fifteen, "He, Jesus, is the image of the invisible God," because um, it. The letter was written, Colossians was written to a world, to a church in a world, which was awash with images of power. Yeah. Power images. Um, you, you had said in, in when I was sort of said I would do this, that you're interested in kind of interesting books and those sorts of things. So here's one. Uh, there we are. It's called okay. Colossians Remixed. Okay. Um, it's called Colossians Remixed, Subverting the Empire. Yeah. yeah by yeah. Brian Walsh and Sylvia Kiesmat. And it explores the idea that Colossians is principally about subverting yeah. power and the abuse of power. And so, so this section, um, 15 to 28, really does that yeah it, it takes, do, doesn't it just yeah, it does it does so so the in in a in a you know a town which would be full of uh, images of caesar uh, yeah. images of uh household gods state gods business gods army gods and the power of the powerful is linked to these images but it then says jesus is the image of the invisible god and everything that we might say but anything powerful, it hands it all to Jesus. So creation, thrones, authorities, the church, power over death, all divinity. What it says is all of that belongs to Jesus. And then um, 
then Jesus brought peace that none of these other pretenders, uh, these kind of Johnny come latelys, can bring because he turns the whole thing on its head. He says, this is what it means uh, when someone who actually has that power, um, uh, the power to, to give or withhold justice, this is, what it, this is what it ought to look like. The whole thing is turned on its head. And so, so the, God's response to all of that yearning that we were exploring in, in, in the, the, the Old Testament passages, even the yearning for you know, revenge as well as justice, um, is that God will bring just judgment on all people and on all power structures. But for those trusting in Jesus, the judgment falls on him. And so we're not destroyed, we're reconciled instead. And so, so I, I think the, the Colossians passage takes all of that question about power and all of these questions about you know, moral failure in, in government and um, uh, yeah, the inability of a, a country like ours to feed its people and yeah. all of those things um, and says, it will only work if you turn all those power structures on their head and the only person that can do it is jesus yeah. um, so and the whole idea of again it comes back to it again doesn't it is that if if we don't look after the world if we don't look after each other if we don't look after the whole of creation yes. if we don't seek to live god's way then 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 there will only be flourishing of some and actually god's yes. will is the flourishing of all Yes. And that, that, yes. that's where the justice comes in, isn't it? It's God's will for the whole of humanity. The whole of creation is flourishing and, and what humankind keeps doing. And it's that, as you say, it's that cycle time and yeah. again. We kind of mess it up or we, we, we put ourselves first and we desecrate the earth and we damage each other and we hurt and harm each other. And it's that constant reminder, isn't it, to coming back. Yeah. I love the idea of, the, you know, it is that turning everything on its head, isn't it? It is, and and you're absolutely right. What what we do is we we somehow enable some to flourish and the rest the rest are lost. Um, and and I think if we then flip to the the Luke passage, which sort of seems out of place with all, all <laughs> these kind of great um, kind of big scale um, passages, I think that helps to bring the whole thing down to the everyday. Yes. Um, yes. The, the trouble it's with great. the Colossians, grand it, it's yeah. so grand, it's so cosmic that yeah. we uh, we can get lost in it. Whereas when we turn to to Jesus with Martha and Mary, um, I think we 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 come to. So what can we do about it day by day? Um, what what do we do about this when we seem powerless to change anything? And so I, I think we're we're kind of used to to the the, the up to date. Um, you know, the, the sort of more recent interpretation of the passage, which I think is entirely right, which is that so Mary isn't just sitting, kind of listening and wondering, uh, you know, about how Jesus is so wonderful. Actually, Jesus as the rabbi, with Mary sitting at his feet, as the expression yeah. has it, he has welcomed her in as a trainee rabbi. Okay, yes. so she is, so she is. Uh, doing something which women were not included in at all. And, and so in that simple moment, Jesus does exactly that thing. He turns a power structure on yep. its head. Um, actually, I mean, the fact that it that it's involves two women here, and Mary in particular, of course, is, is extra relevant at the moment. One of the things which we didn't mention in our news list was Roe versus Wade. Absolutely. Um, you know, we're, we're, we're the idea that, that women, uh, that suddenly their bodies belong to other people again, um, um, and, and they, they've some, somehow the, something that they had fought so long to, to have the right to, to, to have a voice in has been taken away. Um, yeah. That's particularly relevant. But, but I think it is wider than that in terms of power structures. One of the, I think one of the things that listening to, to colleagues and friends uh, with disabilities has really taught me is to challenge what I think that whole business of inclusion really means. Because uh, there's one version of inclusion, which is um, helping them, in inverted commas, to do 
to join in with what we are doing. We are doing, yeah. Um, whereas there shouldn't be any them and we. It's it's how do we all together, because we together are humanity. How do we together find a way of, for instance, worshipping? Um, and that leads us to asking, so do we just let Mary sit in on the class or are we willing to learn from her? Are we willing to put her in a position of leadership? Similarly, then, are, are we allowed, you know, do, do we just sort of help people with disabilities to join in or are we willing to learn from them? And are we willing to have them in positions of leadership? You know, th those are the, those are the sharper questions. And that, I mean, I, find, I, I think that's something that there's so much that the church is asking because it has been, hasn't it? The church goes and does those things for those poor people, whether yes. they're poor, whether they're poor uh, in terms of finance, whether they are, whether there's racial, racial differences, issues around, around sexuality, gender, disability. And it's all yeah. this, it, it's all this, are we brave enough to risk being changed by those encounters? Because yes we it is that whole power balance again and 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 i you know i really appreciate that being brought into this because it is isn't it we might let people in but are we prepared to let go of some of our power yes. so that everybody's voice is able to be heard yes and the church's power can be a very subtle thing you know we we have come to bring you these things and to give you these things that you need fine yes. that, that might be but are we willing also to receive yeah you know, and, 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 and we, we often decide what it is we're going to give people. We absolutely. don't ask them what their needs are, do we? We yeah, make those yeah. decisions for those people we, we consider as some sort of marginalised or, or, or yeah. poor or needy, don't we? Yeah, no, we do. We do. And, you know, I, I have to hold my hands up here and say, uh, you know, in discussions about disability, I, I am not, um, I'm not presently disabled. Um, the disability justice group that I'm part of is a mixed group because the aim is that it should be a part of everyone's conversation equally in all these discussions about power you know i'm you know i'm i sit with i'm one of the bogeymen because i'm yeah you know, middle-aged white male educated all the things that that um that can be problematic and yeah. so you know, we've got to be honest about these things and but but for me, it's that awareness of that. It's an awareness of where you stand, an awareness of that. The watch the baggage that you bring with you, an awareness of of the prejudices that you hold, because if you are aware of those things, when other people point them out to you, you are able to to reflect. Whereas actually, sometimes. If people point them out, you kind of have some of the anger that we saw in yeah. Psalm 50. Oh, that's not me. I'm not. I'm not racist, sexist, whatever. Yeah. And I yeah. think that that knowing where we stand and knowing some of our our vulnerabilities and our failings is actually really important too. Yeah, and and, and being and a willingness to change. You know. Yeah. yeah. In fact, a, will, a willingness for many things is what we needed. I think it's interesting how the reading of of, of the gospel, um, Luke's gospel reading, you know. We are being more gentle on Martha than than I think we have been in the past. I think we've condemned Martha and praised Mary, whatever. And I think you know Jesus affirms her gently. Yeah. And I think that's yeah. another lesson that we could we could we could do with listening to. Yeah. And and he and he's making a particular point. It's not you know. So Luke ten thirty eight to forty two isn't the entire gospel. Uh, but it makes a particular very powerful point and a um, countercultural point doesn't it yes yeah very much so yeah. very much well so. um david i do you know what each week i do this and i kind of go do you know what we could go on for hours i i really believe we could carry on for the next 25 minutes of this but but we have a limited amount of time yeah. um so i am really grateful for your leading uh leading this morning and the sharing and you know the idea of empire is so huge in the text, yeah. but it's still so relevant to the, to our world, isn't it? Um, so thank you so much for your insights. Um, I'm just going to share a little bit about um, about politics in the pulpit for those people who are listening, and uh, and I will offer a question. I think that that I've had prompted by our conversations. So we know that our listeners are a pastor, a knowledgeable crowd, and 
we want to build a community of mutual learning. Uh, each one of us is um, is on a discipleship journey, and that continues. We we are lifelong learners, aren't we? So if you have any questions or thoughts or whether you've used uh, any of the resources in your preaching, we'd love to hear from you. You can find um, you find us on Twitter at uh, at I always get this wrong at pulpit underscore politics or using the hashtag politics in the pulpit or join our Facebook community, which you can access through the Joint Public Issues team uh, Facebook page and the website jointpublicissues.org.uk. Uh, Today's question, um, I really, I think it's that whole idea of, of um, what can we do that speaks of real justice in the world in which we're living? What can we do? And I think, you know, we've talked about the cosmic and not many of us can affect things in an international global level, but come back down to the Martha Mary story. What can we do that that we learn from our from our faith, from our encounter with Jesus that will bring justice in this world? Um, and, and, and I'd like to leave that question for, uh, for everybody. So we go now into our, the world and into our, uh, our pulpits, whatever they may look like. Uh, and I would like to leave us with a blessing. May we be anointed with God's spirit as we bring good news to the poor, proclaim release to the captives, help people to see the world truthfully and let the oppressed go free. And may God bless us in all of those endeavours. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much for your time, David. Lovely to meet no you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.